architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode we try and have a conversation with a contemporary thinker on issues of architecture and architectural thinking and what we are really trying to do is to advance the frontier of architectural thinking into realms that are futuristic, uh, beyond the contemporary, and beyond, in many ways, the pragmatic. Uh, Today we are talking about things that are both pragmatic and beyond the pragmatic. This is my conversation with my colleague Elizabeth Golden, who has recently written a book on the resurgence of use in contemporary uh, in traditional materials. Uh, But our discussion is far-ranging, encompassing issues not just of structure and use and capacity building, but also the potential, uh, let's say, spiritual qualities of traditional materials. I hope you enjoy. Here we go. Thank you for being on Architecture Talk. I'm excited. So Elizabeth, so I'm very interested in, and you've got a book and you've just done a lecture Mm -hmm. and you are actively promoting uh, whatever we want to call it, this idea of traditional materials, uh, uh, vernacular materials or materials that have been used for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me the idea, from my takeaway of it, so I'm hoping you to be corrected, is that uh, the way I read your argument is that something like uh, traditional materials shouldn't be relegated to the rubbish heap of uh, distant places and histories, but that indeed should be studied and uh, considered uh, of relevance and of value to modern or let's say contemporary and future architectural thinking. Uh, and I s- and I and I know and I know that you particularly talk about bamboo and rammed earth and is is, is this is, how would you summarize your argument? I think you summarized it fairly well, but I you know I really want to stress that I am looking at contemporary architecture. Yeah. So for me, I mean, I really started looking at the materials mainly because. I was just fascinated um, to see them starting to be again. I feel like there's there's really been a resurgence of interest, right? And and, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it also in India. Um, But from the side of the architect, to really kind of go back and and look and see how could we start to work with these materials in contemporary architecture. So it's not that I'm studying the materials in and of themselves, because actually in my book I don't. I don't divide the book by materials. I actually divide it by what they do and, how, and how the architects engage with them and yeah. use this, the attributes of the materials to achieve what certain things. Right, right. Um, and so I'm really looking at that sort of moment now of how architects are starting to, I mean, not even starting, but um, I mean, it's been going on for a while, but um, how they're, they're able to combine these now within contemporary systems. Okay, that sounds, so, so you're focused more on sort of contemporary uses of these material. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And from there I assume uh, you must have some thoughts about future possibilities yeah. about these things. Where do, you, where do you think, from your thinking and your practice, where do you think uh, this yeah. can go and you might want to, possibly illustrate that with some example or thoughts you might have? Well, I think I see it going in a couple of directions. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm both optimistic but also pessimistic at the same time. Really? Because, you know, in doing this study, I've, I've found that, you know, we are in this transition period where there are many countries that were, you know, going, they're moving into be, being industrialized and, you know, that, that's sort of registering in the, in the architecture, right? And when you start to study that, you, you see that there is this loss. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so I, it, it seems daunting, you know, to overcome or to try to bring back certain traditional methods within this this sort of industrialized system. So it's, it's a losing proposition. It seems like at it's the a large scale, you know, yeah. On the one hand, it seems like it's a losing op proposition, but then on the other hand, I see then there are architects um, from you know in different countries that are starting to find ways to um, revive these methods, um, and it's. It's not something yet that I see like, oh, it's a global thing and it's happening everywhere. But, you know, I, I do see um, architects really becoming interested again in, in these methods. And I think that for me, so I don't know yet. I mean, I really think there's a jury's out. Yeah. The jury's out, but mm. I'm hopeful and I'm also excited to see, you know, people like Francis Carre and uh, Trang Niha and you know Al Bourdais mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. starting to become known as right. part of it for, for, for working in this yes, way. Yes, for working in this way. Yeah. yeah. So what for you is the key importance of you know working in this way? I mean, why don't we just, you know, build a new ways because they work and you know, what's the why, why, why do it? Why do it? Um, I think it depends on where you're doing it. Um, there's no silver bullet and that's what I have found also through the research that there are different reasons for doing it. Right. In some cases it might be because you want to engage the local community in capacity building and have them sure. be a part of the process. Right. It might be that um, you want to build sustainably in your country and there's that material is available uh -huh. um, and it makes it, it actually makes more sense to use that material because it's plentiful. So you're talking about this in the context of like uh, third world conditions or do you think it's relevant for anywhere? Well, I actually never use the word third world. Okay, what is your Or And I never <laughs> use the word developing either. I, I mean, so I think of it as like um, industrialized or um, newly industrialized or... Um, I, I mean, is it relevant for us here in Seattle? No. No. I don't, I, you know, I, and people ask me this and I'm, I'm really bothered by it actually. I, okay. Like if people ask me like, can you translate this for the United States? And I don't know, like actually I'm, I personally, that's sort of the next thing that I want to do is mm -hmm. try to find a way to work using local materials in a really contemporary way yeah. in the United States. Right, right. Um, so that's something that I would like to do. And there are a few examples of course, but. I um, I think it's applicable, and that's where it's it goes back to the examples that I show in my book. Yeah. Um, Europe, for example. Yeah, um, yeah. There's I mean, Hedzog, you show Hedzog and Demerone. Hedzog and Demerone. I mean, I mean everybody knows about that, right? Yeah, and so um, in the United States, I think there's just a, a fixed way of thinking about building, and it has it always here. It always comes down to money. Um, and so I, now I haven't found, and I looked, I mean, I really tried to find examples that I could use, and there's one, it's a um, straw bale uh, co-housing community that's on Lopez Island that I included, mm -hmm. um, that Methune did several years ago. Okay. And the, the, it was, they chose that material because it was available locally, and it was also an opportunity to bring people together. Um, but there's not a, you know, so we can think of architects in the United States that use earth, for example. So Rick Joy has done houses sure. made out of earth. Yeah. And even um, uh, Olson Kundig, they've used the material too, but I'm not yeah, really so. Eastern Washington. Yeah, yeah and I'm yeah. not so interested in, in that. You know, I think it's great if they use the material, but it doesn't really do anything in those buildings. And, and I, I really set the parameters for the, for my research is to look for um, places where the materials were used um, in multiple ways. So they tempered the environment, uh -huh. they supported the local economy, uh -huh. um, and, and that they weren't just these sort of inert substances, but that they, they um, worked in multiple ways and were integrated within the project in that way. So, so it seems like you also talk about the cultural life of materials. Right. right? Right. I mean, sort of uh, that it's important that they be community and culturally integrated. Is that is that? Yeah, I think. I mean, it doesn't have to be in every case. Like for example, the Herzog and Demerone. It's yeah. not about like capacity building. It's more about the 
the way that it works thermally, and there is some connection actually culturally to the area where that building was built. Um, so, um, and it was also sort of part of the corporate identity of Ricola to use that material because it's sustainable. So there's these sort of multiple things going on. Um, so that's why, I mean, as much as I love Rick Joy and-, and sure, sure. Um, beautiful work. But yeah, it's yeah. beautiful, but it's, it's, um, it's not doing what I was really interested in um, kind of elevating and-, and um, So give us, give us your favorite example of something that works in multiple registers very effectively, which one could look towards as a, as a, not as a model, no, uh, as a uh, sort of example of uh, embedded practice, embodied and embedded practice. Mm -hmm. I think one that comes to mind where I do see it having a very large um, impact or effect would be um, if you look at solid wood construction in the Vorarlberg region of Austria, mm -hmm. um, there's a really long tradition of, of woodworking there and um, now there's, there's also been a kind of development where craftspeople, artisans, um, industry and architects work together to create architecture out of wood. Mm. And the evolution of solid wood construction really does, it can be traced back to this kind of mass, um, you know, log cabin type sure, architecture. Sure, sure, and there is yeah. this sort of development. Uh -huh. um, so there really is a kind of cultural connection there. And so, you know, the, one of the projects that um, I looked at for the, for the book was um, by Bernardo Bader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he, um, actually goes and harvests wood himself, and then he works with local craftspeople to build his house. That's the, the example that's in the book. And um, just the, the way that it's connected to the place and that, that material is very sustainable, it supports the local economy, um, and it's you know, very much tied to local culture. I think that for me is, a, is an example of that sort of, it's, like it's an embedded practice. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, one of the, let's say, problems I have with some of recent work that I see is, you know, how in spite of its, uh, you know, very different use of materials, how nevertheless it ends up looking clean line modernist. Mm -hmm. And my question is, has modernism become our universal cultural aesthetic practice? Is that good? Is that bad? Or would you think that there is some kind of a, a emerging or possible future relationship between how people work with materials and what kind of aesthetic forms we may look at? I think it's a really good question, and I'm I'm wondering if you and I'm wondering if I the way I answer this if this is when you say modernism, do you actually mean? Um, something that projects the Western ideal of architecture? Or In part, yeah, sort yeah. of this clean line, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. unornamentalized, uh, you know, slick. You know, the, I am not interested, you're, I'm not interested in form, actually. Mm -hmm. Form for me is, is secondary, you know, and so, of course, the material will have some impact on the form. Right. That's my, you know, that's sort of my, my um, personal feelings about it, but to answer your question, um, it's cultural, and yeah. so if somebody, what's cultural? I, I think what's cultural is this this desire for the Western ideal, uh -huh. the Western ideal for a house, uh -huh. a house that's clean, a house that looks modern, a mm. house that looks like a house in California, and you mm. might find that same uh, house in. Um, you know, somewhere in the Philippines, and mm -hmm. you're going to see it probably in India. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, there might be slightly changed, but there is a sort of identifiable, like, what does this modern house look like? And, um, and so, yeah, so the materials do get covered. And um, I, I wouldn't say that that's right or wrong, but I think if people, if that's what people desire, and, and yet there's still a potential to use a material that comes from that place and 
it is still connecting to something that's there and that you know crafts people can be involved in it mm. and instead of importing a lot of um, you know <coughs> cement or right. steel I, I don't know I, I would say then then it's 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 okay to have a hybrid it doesn't have to be perfectly sure, sure. pure and I don't know if that answers your question or not yeah it's an open-ended question I mean it's a you know I don't think there's a sort of a clean formula to how to think about but it. But I mean, I, I've talked about it before. Um, if you know, So for example, in Niger, the project that we did in Niger, mm -hmm. the of course, Yame, yeah. yeah, so the history there, um, the they have a very long history of working with um, mud brick, what we know of right. as adobe. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there, there's a tradition of covering those buildings with plaster because right. that protects them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that kind of idea of like covering the building with plaster um, has continued on to the present day but now in a way it's used to, to in a way to make things look modern to cover up mm. the materials that are underneath to make it look like it's a kind of streamlined mm -hmm. straight edged mm -hmm. surface mm -hmm. and so um, I think in some places if you leave bricks exposed for example and you don't really um, cover them, the building is considered to be unfinished. Right, right, right. And so then by covering it, it, it gives it that sort of clean, sort of modern look that people want to have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so expressing the material is actually not something that's done or accepted. So what, uh, what is your, your biography and how does that connect to all this work? I mean, you know, we all have our own cultural histories. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how did you get into this and you know did you grow up uh, surround what, yeah. is, what is your biography well, how does it connect you know my I grew up in a, in a household with an, an artist as a parent so my mother is a painter where where did you grow up in Arkansas Arkansas yeah. yeah so my mother is a, is a painter so mm -hmm. I grew up my and she also taught art at the University of Arkansas so mm -hmm. I grew up my entire life you know, working with different materials, making things, I see. working with ceramics, I um, see. doing you know all all types of drawing. You know, so that was very p much part of my childhood. And I also, being from Arkansas, um, there's a, also a, a great tradition there. I don't know if you know. I do it's not. <laughs> this is my education. So Faye Jones. <laughs> Faye Jones is from from there, and okay. Edward Durrell Stone. Oh. To fairly well Edward Durrell Stone is a modern, high modernist. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, but they also worked with local materials, too. Uh -huh. so yeah, Stone's embassies around the world. Yeah. I remember his but they, But, you know, he's he made a whole line of just absolutely gorgeous furniture out of oak barrels, um, oh. which I was sort of in love with when I was uh, a child. Uh -huh. um, so, and, you know, the art building, actually, at the University of Arkansas it was designed by uh, Ed Stone. So okay. I spent many, many hours there okay. um, looking at the architecture. So, um, yeah, so there it's, you can really see there's this really cool, in some places, this cool combination of like Ozarks, which oh. is very much, there's a sort of tradition of stone architecture there. Okay. And then this combination of modernist architecture. I see. So I, um, it's my, I, I've just. So that was your introduction to architecture? Yeah, yeah. As a kid yeah. growing up, yeah. watching yeah. this stuff. Yeah. But what was your education? I mean, uh, um, well, I, I have a, a B arc. No, from, from where? From the University of Arkansas. Yeah. So I studied there. So, so was it a modernist education? Oh, um, no, I you know I think it was just a standard sort of studio mm. education. Yeah. It was very much you know you will go out and have your own practice kind of education. It was back in the day when people could have a practice and do your structural calculations yeah, and like yeah. do your By own hand. electric plan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I learned how to do all of that. Yeah, with the tables. <laughs> yes, yes. So, you know, I learned all of that. Yeah. And then um, I graduated and I, I just felt like there was something missing from that education that mm. I, I didn't, I was sort of unfulfilled. Like I knew there was more out there. And so yeah. a professor of mine, um, Alejandro Lapunzina, who's yeah. just, um, was one of the best professors I've ever had. Okay. Suggested to me that I go to um, graduate school. Yeah, yeah. And so I applied to Columbia and ended up going there. So did Columbia introduce you to traditional materials? 
No, um, actually <laughs> quite the opposite. Yeah, and sure. actually that might be the reason why um, I went back to that later. I had a kind of reaction to going to Columbia. It was fantastic. I did have Kenneth Frampton, and I would okay. say that, right. that, you know, that was, I think he had just finished the um, studies in tectonic culture. So oh, I was book, one yeah. of, yeah, so I was one of the students that would, took that class, like right as he was finishing up the book. Yeah, yeah. So we were literally sitting there, you know, learning okay. for, you know, from things about architecture from that book, which was, you know, pretty Would amazing. you describe your interest as sort of, how does it connect to and differentiate from Frampton's uh, tectonic culture? Um, I don't think that he was really, I, you know, I, I've thought about that quite a bit. And I think in the end, it, it just, for me, it wasn't, it's not deep enough in terms of like really, really getting into understanding yeah. like why the materials were used or mm -hmm. selected. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very much about, you know, this sort of modernist Yeah, it's thing, sort of a bit distant it's an, it's dis Yeah, yeah. And, and, and for me, because I am, I consider myself first and foremost an architect, mm -hmm. I was really interested in, like, how exactly is this done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, also working on projects that, um, where you do have to understand the process. So, so after closely. Columbia, how did you get into, how did you arrive at the doorstep of, working with the uh, traditional materials? <laughs> um, well, okay, so I did, I ended up going to Berlin. Okay. Um, and so I lived there for about 10 years. I practiced there. Uh -huh. um, and in Berlin, there is um, a building called the Chapel of Reconciliation. Okay. And it was built in the mid 90s in the middle of the no man's land okay. of the Berlin Wall. So a lot of uh -huh. people don't know that the Berlin, Berlin Wall was actually two walls in a way. One side was a kind of ba a barrier and the other side was, was literally the wall that we know is the yeah, Berlin yeah. Wall. Yeah. So this whole area has been redeveloped. It's an yeah, area yeah. in Berlin called Bernauer Strasse. Oh. And this um, chapel was built on the foundations of a church that was destroyed was like right before the wall fell a couple of, of uh, years prior. Mm -hmm. um, and this chapel was made out of um, rammed earth. Oh, I see. Why? Why? Yeah. So they, because the congregation, um, initially th it was a competition and the building that was first proposed was going to be out of concrete. And mm -hmm. the congregation had a lot of negative associations with concrete. They associated it with the Berlin Wall. Right, they right. Associated, associated it with the new development that was going on in Berlin. Right. Um, and so then the architects um, decided, okay, we're just gonna make this in rammed earth because it gives a sense of presence, um, but it's it's temporary in a way. And the, and the congregation really liked that idea that the building wasn't something that was fixed like the wall something that was concrete. That's fascinating. That it so it's a church community that sort of Yes, yes. What kind of a church community? Well, the church community, it was actually divided by the wall. And so there were parts of the congregation that were living in the, in the east and living in the west. Mm -hmm. um, and so this would then reunite that congregation. Um, the other a mud building. Yeah, Rounder. yes. And the other part of it that I think is really um, kind of poetic is that they took a lot of the rubble of the church uh -huh. and incorporated it into the rammed earth of the building. Sure, as aggregate. Quite a bit different from, because Cabuzzi also put the, remember the rubble from the original Notre Dame at Ronchamp into the, in the middle of the walls of Ronchamp. Mm -hmm. But of course the rest of the structure is concrete, so but yeah. this is very different. Yes. Here it's yeah. aggregated. It has a meaning, you mm -hmm. know, and so I, I, so me, I was working on Potsdamer Platz at the time, which was this enormous of construction course. site, you know, very high tech, he, you know, very much about this sort of new Berlin. Mm -hmm. And then I was just astounded, like, why are they building this chapel in the cent in the middle of Berlin yeah. out of earth? This really old technology. Right. And I started to, you know, to do more research and to, you know, watched it grow and. Um, yeah, so it really stuck with me, that idea that there would be a need or a desire mm. in a place like Berlin to build with a material like that and that it would fulfill a function that um, a contemporary material couldn't. 
So that's fantastic. So we are back to the Seattle question now. We could do this here too. But there it really had meaning. You know, it was, it, the, the thing is, is it's, you know, none of these projects are kind of forced. It's not like you go in and no, say, no. like, I absolutely have to do it. No, they're liberative thing, in some sense, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, we are, I mean, I'm, I'm concrete obsessed and concrete <laughs> <laughs> with, my, with my modernist background. Uh, with Chandigarh and all this, um, but uh, these are also prisons of the mind right. and uh, culture. But even Corbusier was interested in building with earth. Was he? Yeah, you didn't know that. I did not know that. Oh, yeah. When when, when did he build? So it? he did. Um, he did as a, 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 he didn't. I don't think he actually ever built anything from earth. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. But he had those, the, he designed the refugee housing mm. that he wanted to make out of Pise, which is mm. um, like, it's pretty much like a compressed earth block. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a little book that I found where there's documentation of, um, I got it from, the, from Berkeley, and I don't remember the name of it, but I'll, we'll find I can it, yeah. give you the information. But I was just fascinated. I thought that's so cool. Also, when I started to do research, I was also, again, like fascinated about, you know, were there then modernist architects that were also interested in these materials? And uh, it turns out, um, you know, Corbusier was one, and um, I found some, you know, cases where, you know, things were used, like reeds were used for form work at the Weissenhof Siedlung and stuff like that, mm -hmm. so. Of course, in a lot of regional modernism around Southeast Asia, a lot of these materials have been tried in various ways, right? Yeah, of I mean, course. Yeah, 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 I mean, there's plenty of examples, but, yeah. um, you know, they're not, it's, it's, for me, it's really, again, it's coming back to this idea that it's contemporary and that it's, you know, architectural. You know, one of the problems with modernism is that it tends to be very secular and pragmatic and materialist, whereas one can read a in more traditional cultures, their association with materials can be said to be more uh, cultural and ephemeral and, if you like, spiritual. And I'm very intrigued by this idea that it's a church community that decides that this would be a relevant material. And you could, okay, you don't like concrete, that's fine, but still, why, why rammed earth, right? Like there is a, one can read these materials uh, and if you, uh, you know, rammed earth, I think there's that example, uh, I think that you gave, of uh, bamboo being considered the birthplace of humanity, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's something like that. You know, so one can also read a lot of these materials uh, non-pragmatically, right? Yes. Right. right? And, right. And I would argue architecture has a lot to do with beyond pragmatic uses. Yes? Yes. Yes? Yeah, and I As think there's room for that, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I'm, I'm trying to sort of evoke a question, get you to respond about whether one can ex access other these other sort of, if you like, dimensions of architectural thinking through these kind of material practices. Would you consider that a reasonable line of thinking yeah I mean that, that I mean they're sort of resonating with meaning right and, yeah yeah and then what do they mean for different people in different cultures and can you I think what you're asking is then can you use that as an architect yes to create a new type of architecture yes maybe? Yes. yes yeah it's funny I've been so focused on the meaning in terms of it being negative that people no longer accept that as a as a desirable medium for living in and then architects are going in and trying to change that medium so that people will accept it again um, I haven't really thought about if you really tap into that sort of resonance that the material has mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. it um, I mean I feel like the Chapel of Reconciliation has that mm -hmm. you know and and actually like the the um, I'm trying to think, not priest. What's the other word for priest? Uh, not in pastor, Catholic. Pastor. Yeah, so sermon. the pastor, I was thinking of it, yeah. the word in German, but yeah, right. the pastor. What's the word in German? Um, I, I think it's, well, you know, it's, it's, it's like predigt or. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, in any case, the, 
the pastor of that church even referred to the earth as Heil Erde. What does that mean? Heil Erde means healing earth, if you're really going to... Healing tra- earth. Healing earth. And so that there's, a, there's a, an ancient tradition. I mean, even now, like people will... Y- you can eat earth and it has a lot of medicinal properties. It can heal your digestion. I think in some cultures they, they eat it because it helps you to feel full too, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. there are some cultures where you, where you and so ger- in German they actually have a word for it, Heil Erde. Mm-hmm. And you can still, you can go into a, a shop and like buy Heil Erde. And, really? and yeah, and it's, it's a kind of medicinal thing that's for your digestion. So eating architecture. <laughs> Yeah, eating architecture. Um, this is a fantastic uh, dimension to thinking about architecture. Mm-hmm. You know, and the other thing too is that is that um, these materials they're political mm. too. There's a political dimension to them as well of that course, I think is course. really important. So there is this slogan that's always stuck in my head that Adobe is political, mm. right? And that you can you can actually take Earth form it and then occupy the landscape and claim it and it becomes yours. Right. Um, this is different than what you're talking about, yeah, you yeah. know, this sort of resonance. Um, but there's a but connection there. I mean, there's a continuity. This idea of, you know, when you build with adobe, you're building with the body of the earth. Yeah. And a and, uh, and, uh, lot of cultures and a lot of s- cultural and spiritual practices, you know, begin around... Uh, uh, inhabiting the body of the earth. Mm-hmm. To live is to live in the body of the earth. Chthonic uh, forms of way of thinking mm-hmm. versus tectonic, kind of the opposite of tectonic in that sense. Uh, well, I, I mean, actually, there's you know um, some studies that support that our interaction with the material so with earth for example mm-hmm. has shaped our our brain that that actually helped us to sort of develop our brain so whether it's earth or stone mm-hmm. that, that there was this interaction between um, us and the material and that it actually helped us to develop um, our thinking and thought processes really so, yeah Say more. What do you mean? I'm not. Well, um, so this archaeologist, and she's one that I read quite a bit, and she influenced my thinking. Uh So the idea is that, um, so what she says is that, and I don't know if it's her idea necessarily, I, I I think it is her idea. But that you know, working with stone tools, for example, mm-hmm. helped us to go from being like a hominoid to being human. That mm-hmm. that our brain development was actually partially contingent on us interacting with the environment and mainly with materials. Right, right. And right. so, um, and that like shaping soil, for example, changed the way that we yes. lived. Yes. Right, and then that would then help us to develop our. I mean, the entire Mesoamerican sort of pre-Columbian architecture is about shaping soil, right? I mean, these what we badly call pyramids, they're not pyramids, they're sort of these stepped platform mounds. Mm -hmm. They don't go anywhere. There isn't anything much on top of them. There's a temple, maybe a site for sacrifice and, you know, some steps. Mm -hmm. It's it's the, the, uh, the whole effort seems to be dedicated towards accumulating the earth and shaping it and forming it and communities doing it and generations of communities doing it. It's about simply forming the material, mm. particularly earth. And people would bring earth from great distances and add it to uh, these great mounds. Mm-hmm. And you wonder how that connects to their consciousnesses and sort of sense of being in the world. Because we tend to think of architecture as space making, right? Okay, now you have nice space, you have beautiful space, large space, comfortable space, you know, spiritual space, Mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But, you know, architecture is also simply material forming. But I think if you're thinking about that, you know, that architecture, I don't know, for me it's like I'm not even thinking about space or architecture. That's why I told you I'm not so interested in form. Right, right. It's about this interaction with the material um, and that, like, exchange that Mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. I think that's so... It's just, it, it's, I think it's fascinating. I mean, it's, it kind of reminds me of that 
quote by Richard Sennett. He says that we become, I don't, I mean, this is, this is just a summarizing of yeah, what yeah, he yeah. says, but that um, we become interested in things that we know that we can change. You know, so we, so then there's this connection between you and that, that which we know that we can change or right. manipulate. Yeah. And that thing is not, is not an inert thing that it then changes and then it changes our thinking. And it changes us. Yeah, and it changes us. It's a different way of uh, thinking about Louis Kahn's asking the brick what it wants to be. Yeah. Right? Exactly. It's a sort of a conversation. You ask the brick what it wants to be, and then you do something with the brick. Yeah, and then the brick changes you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me think of being a kid, you know. I remember digging this huge hole, filling it with water, trying to make a bridge over it, and sort of this whole earth structure. Mm -hmm. And kind of the uh, yeah, I mean, probably everyone of it. everyone has those memories. I'm sure of like making the mud pie. Yeah, yeah. Or you know, yeah, mucking around in the puddle. Yeah, I mean, and we were far inland in Arkansas. Also, you're far inland, but yeah. I think a lot of people associate uh, beaches and sort of making things on the beach with all these with earth and sand which floats around and the holes and the constructions mm -hmm. and the tunnels and the, and the this and the that. These are sort of uh, deeply embedded, embodied uh, human experiences mm -hmm. which get sort of distanced as we grow older and become more abstracted and intellectualized and highly calculated uh, through uh, the uh, economics of space. Yeah, but I mean, there's, I think all the, those natural materials, stone, wood, there's, we've always sort of seen ourselves in them mm. in some way. You know, stone is, there's so many different cultures that see them as their organs or their, their fill of spirits or, and, but it's us like, looking into that material and somehow seeing ourselves in them too. So again, they're not dead. There's, we're imbuing them with, with something. And then that is what draws us to them. And I think then, again, coming back to your original sort of thought about the, this architecture of materiality, I mean, I, I'm sure, I mean, we can probably, if we sat down and thought about it a little bit, we can come up with buildings that have that resonance of the material. Makes me think of Michael Pollan's book, uh, How to Change Your Mind, mm -hmm. where he talks about his experiences. I don't know if you've read yeah, the book. Yeah, no, I went to see uh, him speak oh, actually okay. here in Seattle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't read the book, but I, I got the gist of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> the discussion. Yeah. Uh, about uh, becoming one with, uh, well, there's the ego consciousness, which locates me somewhere in my head or somewhere in my body. But then he talked about this conscious, co talks about this consciousness, which uh, you know you are, you realize there's a sort of general pervasive consciousness to everything, not flowers, right. trees, yeah, but also totally. earth, wind, and you see your own sort of that sort of consciousness pervading everything. Right. And that's a way to think about. Um, the continuities between the world and us and therefore the shaping of the world as the shaping of the spirit force of the world if you like mm -hmm. or the consciousness of the world it's not just you know making inert material slavishly do what you tell it to do right it's uh, it's interacting with consciousness mm -hmm. in a particular way yeah i mean for me this is the the it's the part of the research. That I mean, is I, this I crazy thinking, or what do you think? No, about? I'm like I'm so excited yeah. about that and what, what we're talking about right now, and I yeah. would love to write more about that, mm. but I, I just haven't haven't gotten to it yet. But no. that's what I I don't know. I, I I would love that there is this architecture that does what you're talking I about. I mean, it's this is frontier of architectural thinking. I mean, we've got a. I mean, I, I mean, I read. Uh, Gender theory, I read, you know, we all read, uh, this feel like everybody is advancing 
the frontiers of uh, of thinking given our contemporary you know re-examination of a lot of things and and what i am dedicated to whatever i'm very interested in particularly around this podcast is to you know try and take architectural thinking to where it isn't sort of re-celebrating established wisdoms of right. the greats but uh, where could we be going you know what are the sort of unexplored mm -hmm. uh, frontiers what are the implications of contemporary theory and contemporary uh, issues in the world on, on this so that's what I'm interested in anyway Thank you for being on Architecture Talk, Elizabeth. Yeah, it's been great thank you talking so to much. you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is Vikram Prakash, your host, and our producer is the one and only Sammy Prouty, a graduate student of architecture here at the University of Washington in Seattle. I hope you all enjoyed our conversation, and if you did, please do take a moment to subscribe and to rate us on iTunes. See you next time. Take care. Goodbye.